Hello, Giants fans, and welcome to your Valentine's Views podcast for Friday, December 16, two days before your New York Giants face the Washington Commanders in a game that uh, very, very well could decide which of those two teams makes the uh, the NFC playoffs. And uh, here to help me uh, break it down in a crossover edition of the podcast is Jamal Forrest of SB Nation's Hogs Haven and the Trapper Dive Podcast. Jamal, thank you so much for uh, spending some time. Absolutely, man. I appreciate it and appreciate you sending that invite out, man. I'm, I'm glad to, I'm glad to talk some ball. Hey, no problem. Hey, listen, I have to start with this. I was I was in the locker room after the uh, the Giants and the Commanders 2020 tie two weeks ago. And Giants players, you know, some of them had never experienced a tie before at any level. And they didn't quite know how to take it. (laughs) They felt like they felt like, in all honesty, I think most of them said it feels like we lost a game because I don't know how to I really don't know how to feel about it. And, And and there are benefits to to the tie instead of a loss when it comes to playoff seeds and all that kind of stuff. But did did you feel like like it was a loss for the Commanders too? No, <laughs> absolutely not. Um, now, granted, the this there's been similar sentiments from the actual Commanders coaches and players. Like even Ron said after the game, "Don't quote me verbatim," but he said something to the effect of like this tie felt weird, like it was unfinished business. I didn't even know, like I couldn't get mad at them for anything. They didn't lose. Like I, it was nothing I could get mad at, but um Mm -hmm. to that extent the players and coaches feel some type of way from but from my perspective i felt the word that i used consistently throughout that week was relief (laughs) like there was several times throughout that game obviously that you're looking at the giants and and you're saying they should have beat us they should have beat us here um we missed out on several opportunities obviously um in the red zone to, to kick things off uh taylor heineke overthrowing logan thomas you miss out on points there um, and then uh, there was a couple of times where Washington um, now the penalties are kind of muddy things up and muddy the conversation up just, but just from an actual execution standpoint, uh, you have the giants uh, just at the, the end of the game, have a wide open Darius Slayton in the coverage bus and um, Bobby McCain and, and, and Cam Curl, I believe, or maybe Kendall Fuller have a mix up in terms of their responsibility and a cover three um, and, and essentially leaves Darius Slayton wide open on that third level of the defense and he's wide open like and drops the base. So you're talking about a a direct impact uh, of the outcome of the game right there. Um, And then you have an offside that's not called in overtime from Washington. Washington I I forgot all about that play. Yeah. How do you, how do you, you know, I think I, there were so many instances and that's one that I had completely forgotten about. I think everybody was in panic mode at that point, including the officials. And Maybe I don't know what Washington it. defender it was, but he was clearly lined up offside, would have yep. given the Giants a first down, and I think they ended up punting instead. So this one was – so uh, F.A. Obata was the one that was offside, and um, this was at the the very last – the field goal that was missed from um, – 58. Your, yeah, yeah, from 58. Yeah. So that would have gave him a – it's still 50 yarders, but, it, like, 53, much better than 58. Um, yeah. And you have a, a better chance of really trying to get that uh, – get the win. So, like, there was just several opportunities for me where I'm like, I understand that Washington had their opportunities to win as well. But when you look at what the Giants were able to do, taking advantage of, of Washington in certain situations, and uh, even with um, that first down conversion to Slayton where – there was an unsportsman like at the end of the at the end of the game. I mean, at the end of the play from your center or your offensive lineman that moves them back 15. That first down alone puts the Giants in position to win the game and seal the game because you have a seven point lead. So like, there's just right. several things where I'm like, hey, I would love for Washington and Ron Rivera to be much more aggressive than what they are right now in overtime. But the way things are playing out and the way things have played out, I'll get the tie. <laughs> Right. Yeah. It felt like I know that it felt like for the Giants, the the opportunity, the 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 drop by Darius Slayton, who he knew at the end of the game that he had messed that up, too, because I don't know why he did what he did, but he made a conscious choice to stop running and to leap for that ball 
Yeah. And if he if he simply continues to run, he runs right underneath it. And, and the the penalty that you talked about, but there were there were several opportunities. The Giants botched a a third and three. I uh, think yep. it was in overtime. They botched a third and three where they had a miscommunication in the backfield, and then they ended up punting. And I think they did the right thing by punting because a tie is better than than not getting the first down there and, and handing Washington a win. But you have so many opportunities. I felt like that was a game. I think you and I agree. I felt like that was a game that the Giants should have won. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. And, and I would just like, I would say one thing and just ask you, my, my question would be, um, how did, like throughout the week, how, or maybe actually this week, actually, I would I would say, how are, how are Giants players coaches how are they focusing in or what what are the conversations like for Washington this week um but in terms of uh just to, to close out that game yeah Giants I think had more opportunities and, 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 and bigger opportunities to really take advantage of that game um for a long period of time especially when Washington really had no answers for how uh Wink Martindale wanted to to pr- provide pressure and present pressure pressure looks and um Essentially, they they got calls wrong, meaning the offensive line and, and maybe Taylor Heineke. They got calls wrong at some of the more pivotal moments of the game. Um, you think about that. I think it was the first play in overtime, I believe. I may be wrong, but where Aziz Ojalari almost has the safety or maybe a strict strip sack if he was because he had a clean hit on Taylor Heineke. Um, that leads to a sack that, that puts him at the that pins him at the one yard line. Um, there was other opportunities in the second half, specifically that third quarter where uh, you have uncovered defenders with a free path to the quarterback um so like just how wink was able to confuse that offensive line and and really get them in the looks that he wanted he dictated that that uh the trenches game and uh and and it was really just looking at it on tape it was really just uh impressive to see from my eyes um and and how he was able to dress things up so i agree 100 um that this was a game for me that that washington got lucky uh, and escaped out of, which was a relief, but Giants should have won it. All right, turning to uh, turning to this week, it's a really sort of odd circumstance. The scheduling, the way that this worked out, the uh, the Commanders play the Giants two weeks ago, get a bye, get to play the Giants again this Sunday, two weeks later at home. And the way I've looked at that is Washington gets three weeks of basically concentrating on one team. And, you know, you're at home and I know that that uh, the Washington crowd, maybe it's better this year with them making a playoff run, but it's not always fantastic. I would I'm going to guess that there's going to be a healthy number of Giants fans in the uh, in the stands on Sunday night. Of course, you know. But but the game for me, it for me, it just it sets up really well for Washington just because they've got that that built-in advantage of coming off the bye and and not having had to worry about, you know, the Giants had to play the Eagles and, and got pounded and just not having to worry about another team for basically three weeks is is pretty much unheard of. Uh, I think that's true. Uh, I heard well to specifically the the fact that you know three three weeks to uh, the same opponent two times and you have a bye week in between. I think that's true in terms of like that being unheard of. I think it actually only happened three times um, since nineteen sixty or seventy. My my number may be wrong, but I actually heard it today in terms of like how often that scheduling court has actually happened. But I, I will say one thing. Um, I don't I, I really don't know how like to what degree you can really continue to study an opponent and, and like feel after three weeks or two and a half weeks or whatever that you can like have answers for every single thing. Like obviously a bye week helps prepare because um you're you're gonna sit there and focus on the 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 upcoming opponent. Um and it just so happens to be the team that you place faced last week, but this isn't like it's always been Daniel Jones for Washington. Like Daniel Jones has always created problems for Washington. And with Saquon, um, his ability to uh, just really be explosive player, obviously the last few weeks, it hasn't really from a, 
offensive line standpoint, um, it hasn't really been benefited him. He hasn't really been able to take off to an extent, uh, but he's made plays and he's been able to create. And, and I think when when it comes to Washington, um, again, I don't think the game planning or preparation is going to be something where it's like I have to get back to the drawing board or the defensive side of the standpoint. Um, and, and, and maybe it just comes out to straight out like we have to take care of two players and two players only. Um, and if we can do that, that's fine. But on the other side, um, sure, I can I can see where obviously we talked about pressure, right? Um, Wink Martindale being able to uh, get into Scott Turner's head, <laughs> essentially, and, and really <laughs> actually when it comes to even play calling, um, got him in some situations where, you know, he didn't pr- provide the best plays. Um, like, for example, another overtime call where you're talking about that, those those screens that that Washington ran um, throughout the game. Uh, uh, man coverage is something that, that the Giants like to run, especially uh, on third down. And you're talking about a guy who was really prepared for it. Like the screen call led the players directly to um, the Giants players directly to the ball. Um, and you're not even able to get anything on third and nine. You actually gain nothing um, on the plus side of the field. So uh, from that standpoint, uh, self scouting and understanding, like how can you counter offensively can be one thing that you can take, take, uh, take advantage of throughout that bye week that the Giants uh, really can't really doesn't have a luxury of but um, to what degree that really helps them I I don't know I I think it really just comes down to the execution um, uh, from the the people up front in the trenches um, but also their ability on the defensive side of football to to really contain and stay disciplined against Daniel Jones yeah I would think no as you indicate both teams know each other really well at this point I don't think either team can reinvent the wheel as in terms of what they are. Yeah, that's literally right. Yep. That's- at this point, they can't reinvent the wheel in terms of what they are. But what I've said about the Giants is they're a, you know they're a run first team. They want to run. They want to control the. They want to control the clock. They want to control the pace of the game. And I think Washington wants to do a lot of that as well. That you know the Giants want to pass the ball on their terms. Their offensive line hasn't been great, but I think this is the kind of game where if either team's got anything up their sleeve, if they've got anything they haven't shown, whether it's a whether it's a trick play or or a scheme or something, or even just you know, on offense, you know, eye candy that they haven't shown to get to a play that they've run a hundred other times that they like. But I think this is the kind of game where, where you might see those things, but it still comes down to these teams are what they are. Yeah, I'm with you. And I think like part of the conversation for Washington um, has been about Taylor Heineke and how he can really up his game. Um, I kind of, slightly touched on it early when we talked about missed opportunities for Washington in that first game and, and how Taylor overthrew Logan Thomas for what would have been a touchdown. Listen, um, we thanked him for that, by the way, we thanked yeah, him hey, very much y'all, for that. Y'all, sh- y'all should have. <laughs> um, and, and, and to be honest with you, y'all should have been uh, mad at the, the, the Giants guys at the back end of the game where he threw you all like two or three interceptions that wasn't caught. He, um, he tried. I, I counted, you mentioned those, and and that goes back to opportunities for the Giants to win the game. I counted four balls that the Giants either had their hands on or had, like, there was one that went right over the head of a defensive back, and they weren't all easy catches. But out of four opportunities, you'd think you'd, you'd, think you'd get one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and to that point, like, like with Taylor um, – when you when you look at him and just understand like the quarterback that he is, um, that's kind of where the the nuance this is. Like, how can how can you play better? How can this team come out in, in a more prepared situation? Or or maybe like in, in three weeks, what have you learned in particular? And and that's kind of the thing with uh Taylor altogether this year is is how has he been able to really stack these games? How has he been learning? Um, or is this who he is? And, and I think that's the bigger the bigger thing. Like he's had this opportunity because Carson Wentz has gotten hurt. Um, you happen to go five one and one now six one and one. Excuse me, as a starter. Um, but a lot of this is 
to do off the backs of like the defense and the run game primarily. And, and Taylor has been there to save the day at the end of the game for a couple of your games. Um, but how do you look throughout the course of a game and how do you take advantage of opportunities that are presented to you at the very beginning? And how do you manage the game from start to finish? Um, sure, every quarterback is going to have that, that one play where you're like, I'm glad that it wasn't a turnover because it could have it could have gotten ugly. Like quarterbacks are going to have that. But the variance or to the degree in which Taylor has it compared to the good plays that he's that he's making or not making, that's kind of where the, the difference is. And um, when you're asking just essentially what can your team do better like when you're playing a team th- uh, two times in the, in the next three weeks or, or over the course of a three week time frame, um, you have to look at that quarterback and say, all right, um, I know how they attacked us. Um, I know how they're attacking me. I know where the weaknesses may be. And, and I just have to trust myself and my teammates and, and give them an opportunity to make a play as well, or take the ball into my own hands, use my legs and see where that goes because I have not been using my legs and I've not been helping this offensive line out. I have not been helping this offense out by staying a statue in the pocket. Here's you mentioned Carson Wentz and we're talking about Taylor Heineke and Heineke's had a good run. And for whatever reason, the commanders seem to respond to him. He's sort of the everyman yeah. quarterback and they really respond to him. But here's something that I've had in the back of my mind. I know that Carson Wentz, is back to practice this week. I know he's healthy enough to play. I know that the commanders will stay with Taylor Heineke, but can you envision a scenario where it's the middle of the third quarter and things are not going well for the Washington offense? Can you envision a scenario where they ask Carson Wentz to come in and try to win them a game? Absolutely. Absolutely. I I don't think that the coaches are sold on, on Taylor um, at all. And and but but what I mean by that specifically, I, I think that they know and, and are very aware that the player, like you mentioned it from the outside perspective, players respond to Taylor. Like they don't and, and and even I always go back to the John Athen, John Jonathan Allen quote where uh somebody had asked them after a game, like, how does Taylor consistently get this done? Like, how does Taylor continue to win? And he said, I don't know. Like, he doesn't know how <laughs> Taylor Taylor does it, but they 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 continue to find ways to win. And so your point where you're saying, uh, is there a scenario that I can envision uh, Carson coming in? Yes. It's, it's kind of what I what I mentioned uh, uh, in the response before. Like you cannot have an inconsistent game. Specifically, you cannot come out and, and misfire on several opportunities. You can't be late in the red zone. You can't have turnovers early on in the game. You can't be in a situation where your team is possibly trailing 10 to nothing in a situation where they feel like, meaning they, your coaches, feel like, we should never, we should never been trailing in the first place. Like that, these are those situations where you're sitting here saying, I think that Carson Wentz may have to go in sooner than we anticipated. Is he ready to go? Okay, he is. All right, let's get him warmed up at halftime and, and get that man out there on the field because Taylor isn't getting it done in this first half. And I can't afford to lose this game. We can't afford to lose this game. We have a playoff race ahead of us. Um, and to add on to this though, Ed, mm-hmm. this is a very big stress for Taylor. Um, and I, I had just said in this the, the Trapper Dive live stream, he has never had a stretch of games like this in his NFL career. And and what I mean by that is like you're you're going up against the Giants coming out of your bye week. First and foremost, uh, as I mentioned, what have you learned over these two weeks? What can you do better against the Giants um, in situations that really ask for you to make a play and step up and make a play? But outside of that, you have three more games down the stretch where you are right now in the sixth seed of the NFL playoff race. You are coming out of bye week in your last four games as the sixth seed, and you are leading the team right now because Carson Wentz was hurt, and you've won, you've won six out of, your, uh, out of your last eight games, and this is a major moment for you. Sure, you got in against Tampa Bay in the playoff game, but that was a one-off. Like, nobody expected you to really win that game. Nobody knew what you can do, and that was a playoff game. Then that very next season, you're coming in as a backup. Nobody expected you to start the entire season. Ryan Fitzpatrick gets hurt. Now you have to start the entire season. Now, same situation where you have Carson Wentz in, but now you have a 6-1-1 one one record uh, from a quarterback standpoint, but your team is also 6-1-1 one one with you leading the helm, and you're granted a playoff spot at the very end of the season, or you have one at the very end of the season. How do you maintain it? How does the team maintain it? But also, how do you look 
And if you do lose and you do miss the playoffs, are you the major reason, uh, especially for a guy who is in a contract year, he doesn't have a contract at the end of the season. So how do you look in these four games? Because the odds are going to be on you right out the gate, Sunday night football against the New York Giants. It's a very big moment for Taylor uh, and the biggest moment, I think, of his career. All right. What's what's the latest of what uh, of what you're hearing in terms of of Chase Young? We thought maybe he would play a couple of weeks ago. I still see him listed as limited in in practice, and and who knows what that means? To be honest with you, nobody nobody really knows what that means. But is is there an expectation that he is going to play Sunday night, or? Are you guys kind of still in the dark? Like we ju- we just don't know. Uh, we just don't know. Uh, it has been what four weeks now, maybe since he's been activated. Um, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but he's been activated for nearly a month, and he has not played yet. Um, and, and at this point, we've come to understand that it's not a physical thing now; it's really a mental thing for Chase Young. And like the doctor said, he's as healthy as he's going to get in terms of like his knee. Like it's not it's not the knee part anymore. Um, Expectation wise, I remember Jack Del Rio said a couple of weeks ago and he said something again today um, in his pressure, essentially to the point of when Chase Young comes back, we want him to fit into the scheme. We want him to fit into this unit. We don't want him to go out there and essentially be a hero. Uh, understand your assignment, do your job, trust your role, trust your teammates, because uh, this is like this is who we are now. We have chemistry, essentially. Again, that's not verbatim, but the point of that is, is understanding how Chase Young can really fit into this lineup. And last year, um, the defensive line altogether, not just Chase, but the defensive line altogether did not play as a unit. And that's what really hurt these guys. It's a talented bunch, but if you're not playing together, you're going to have so many issues where you're not really creating pressure or you are and nobody's able to finish. Um, And that's kind of the issue that they saw last year. So fast forward into your question, expectations on Chase. Um, Nobody really knows anymore because of how they've played it over the past few weeks. Um, They're not necessarily given for sure or matter of fact answers in that he will or he will not play. So you never really know until game day. Um, And the one time where you thought that he could have played, I think it was the Falcons game because that was right before the Giants. uh, He had gotten sick. So he like some people expected him to play some people that I know um, that's around Chase expected him to play. Um, and I say that loosely. I, I don't want to make it sound like I, I, I know anybody special, <laughs> but I say that loosely in that like they expected him to play, but he got sick um, and, and nobody knows anymore. So it's just a weird situation. And, and truthfully speaking, Ed, if they're in a game uh, there with four games left in the season and Chase doesn't play this week. Uh, I don't really anticipate him coming back at all. It really serves no point to play three games. All right, so here's here's an interesting situation for you. I get asked all the time, what's a successful season for the Giants? Mm-hmm. And people's mm-hmm. expectations of that have changed because the Giants started off 6-1. and one. I mean, a lot of people figured the Giants would win six or seven games this year, and and – and that seven, eight wins would be a good season. And you can argue, you can still argue that it would be in a lot of ways. A lot of good things have happened for the Giants. The From the commander's perspective, what happens here if they don't make the playoffs? If they don't make the playoffs, are they looking for a new quarterback? Are they looking for a new head coach? You know how many how many changes are they making? Is it still a successful season, or are they looking at at, at some sort of an overhaul here? Um, I'm really glad you asked that question. Uh, so heading into the season, Ron Rivera and I never like when people ask heading into the season, like what are your predictions for Washington um, this year? And I said ten and seven, uh, ten wins minimum. Um, but I, I landed on 10 and 7 in terms of my, my record. But the reason why I brought that up is like when people ask, what are your expectations? I always base it on Ron Rivera. And Ron Rivera had a knack this offseason to say, this is the year where I expect us to take a leap. This is the year where I uh, think that we have been ready or we're mature enough to, to really overcome 
you know the the issues and the 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 flaws that we had last year we're here to 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 make some waves and all we need is a quarterback essentially um so i have always thought that um if you're not making the playoffs then this year is a failure um and for washington to start out one and four uh that's kind of the only point where i thought that ron would be fired if things continue to uh like go downhill and I, I don't think at this point now that they've recovered that that was the case or that will be the case at least this year um personally speaking since this is our really our first time talking i'm not that big of a fan of ron um i do have respect for him um and i do understand the job that he's done to reel this season back in and give washington a chance at the end of the season um but uh, and so I have to give him his credit while I still personally am not like that big of a fan of him. Uh, but I, I think that the, the job that he's done to this point ultimately lands them in the playoffs. Um, I, that's how I see this season playing out for him. So in turn, you're, you're, you're staying here at least another year, uh, with the ownership situation, you kind of understand that even with him being here for another year, his job is not guaranteed beyond a 2023, um, is, is my guess. Uh, but in terms of quarterback, they need help. Um, Taylor Heineke, sure, they're winning with him, but they're not winning because of him. Um, and I think that's the major difference. They're they're not winning in spite of him. I, I used to think that, but um, I don't think they're winning in spite of him. Uh, but at the same time, all of that is for none when you have a quarterback who is consistently inconsistent. Um, and is more so on the, the side of not being able to execute in 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 big spots of a game. Uh, they're still poor on third downs. Um, they don't execute in the red zone as often as they should. Um, even though they have like the top 10 in, in trips to the red zone, they're not executing as a top 10 unit in the red zone. Um, and that goes beyond Taylor. That goes beyond Carson. Or excuse me, that goes beyond Taylor altogether because Carson has had those issues too. So neither one of these guys are the answer. They will be looking for quarterback despite uh, or irregardless of the fact that they make the playoffs or not. Um, that's going to be on the agenda. That's going to be a number one thing for these guys after this season. And that's always fun because you'll be in the bottom half of the first round, and that uh, that that Tell doesn't make it. it easy. Yeah, and the Giants, Tell the Giants, the, the Giants are a little bit in the same boat. If uh, if they decide to move on from Daniel Jones, which, what do you think they'll do though? Are they going to move on from him? What do I think they'll do? Yeah, I I think that they will try to get Daniel Jones to sign a short term contract, maybe two years. I think that makes sense to me. I don't think I don't think Daniel Jones is going to have a huge explosive market out yeah. there. Now, now honestly, if they go into Washington Sunday night and they win and he lights it up and they make the playoffs and but I don't that that could change. I don't expect it to change, but I mean he's done he's done a good job this year. He's done a very good job considering what he's working with and the circumstances with their wide receivers and their offensive line and, and all of that. And I think where the giants sit in the draft, you know, bottom half of the first round, probably somewhere around 20, even if they don't make the playoffs, you're still, you're going to have a hard time getting one of the top tier quarterbacks. Yeah. So you might be in a situation where you're better off to give him the two year deal you know, if, if you can come to a to an agreement, you know, two years and 35, something like that. That's, that's where I seem to land when I think about it. Mm -hmm. Two years, 35 million total, somewhere around there. And, and build your roster and push that, push that long-term decision off until you've got more resources and, and you've got a, a, a more complete roster. I love how you said that at the end, um, the resources part, because uh, Washington, I mean, to a to a degree, they're a step above or, or a step ahead of of the Giants um, in terms of like insulating your quarterback. Uh, like you have the the weapons, you lost offensive linemen. Like clearly, you have to improve that interior, and that's one of my major issues with this game. Is like if if you can't protect or if you can't um, identify those pressures up front, then you really don't stand a chance again in terms of moving the ball or, or scoring points. Um, so that's one thing. But uh, continuing on, the defense has clearly learned 
uh, from last year and, and been able to trust themselves a little bit more. And, and Dale Rio has found places for um, certain certain players on that defense that benefits the defense, but also benefits the player in terms of like their comfortability. Um, and, and all of these things matter. And now you're looking at the quarterback position. You're saying we're right back where we were at the start of the 2022 offseason. All we need is a quarterback. Um, and how do you get that one? And I think Washington is at that point where uh, they may look for a bridge guy. It may be Taylor Heineke. He may ultimately want to take other opportunities elsewhere um, that may give him a, a, a better secured chance of, of competing for a starting job or he may come back. But I think you need a bridge guy um, and maybe uh, somebody in the draft as well that can compete uh, in this room. So uh, we'll see. But I am in that that point that, you know, the roster part is, is the strongest thing. Um, you just got to find a quarterback who can really plug in and, and, and get the job done at a, at a serviceable level consistently. Yeah. And I, it's kind of an aside here, but I always try to remind giants fans that, and that this is year one with Joe yeah. Shane and Brian Dable. It's year one. And the the game against the Eagles the other day was a little bit of a rude awakening because although the Giants have done well this year, you, there's not a single thing that they do better than the Eagles. There's not a single thing they do better than that team. There's not a single position group on the roster that's better than what the Eagles run out there. They're just just not. You know, I look at Washington and and I'm I would probably say Washington, played a really good game. Washington mm -hmm. caught the Eagles on the right night. Washington's not better than the Eagles either, but, but the NFL is, is that sort of league where you just never know what's going to happen. But I always remind people that the giants are in year one of putting together or trying to put something back together. That's been terrible for the last five years. So, so whether they make the playoffs or not, I think you can argue that a lot of good things have happened for the Giants this year. And I'm a fan of Dayball. Like, I, I'm an NFL guy, so um, sometimes, specifically Commanders fans, like, they're, they're all Washington. Um, I'm not saying everybody is, because I know some people who are fans of the NFL as well, but they're all, they're all Washington, so they don't have that perspective of understanding, like, there are other good situations, and some of them just so happen to be in a division. Um, I, I like Dayball. Uh, I, I like how he's been able to really get you off to a good start. Like competing in every game is important. Um, obviously the 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 game against the the Eagles got out of hand, but at the end of the day, like, what do you trust more the 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 overall sample size, the larger sample size, or do you trust one game? Like you said, was a rude awakening against a very strong team. Um. In, in a better overall team, but at the end of the day, you all compete every single week. Um, and that's just part of the story uh, with a new head coach. But if you see that, it's not the fact that, or it's not the case that um, they're ill-prepared or they're they're not coach, uh, coachable because they're showing that. It's about the talent at that point. And and I'm I'm excited to see what Dayball does just from a overall standpoint. I like him in Buffalo. So it's it was unfortunate that he went to New York. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but here we are. I'm giving compliments. Uh, to the guy, man, he's doing a he's doing a solid job. Just regardless of what happens at the end of the season, if they make the playoffs or not. Cool. So, so last thing for you, how do you see Sunday night unfolding? I'm guessing, I'm guessing probably it's another close game. It's another fourth quarter game. It's, it's, it's can the Giants? Yet. It's can the Giants stop Taylor Heineke from converting fourth and twenty one or whatever <laughs> the heck that was? You know, and, and can they can they catch an interception? <laughs> you know, so what do you? How do you see it? Um, twenty one seventeen. I is that was easy for me because I just did the prediction on the live stream. So twenty one seventeen, Washington. Um, I, I think I, everything you said. I think it's going to be a close game. Um, I think that it's going to be another back and forth to to whatever degree twenty one seventeen tells you tells you this is a back and forth game. <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. these are just two teams that really struggle offensively to to put up points and uh with with the way that both are struggling interior for the interior offensive line. Uh, it makes way for both teams to really have their, their way at times defensively. So um, it, it does come down to the turnover game. Once again, as well, offensive line is important. Trenches are important, 
but that turnover game as well, like one of the bigger things in that first game that uh, is, is noticed but doesn't get talked about a lot is how the turnovers kind of even themselves out in that one game. Like Washington had that turnover at the beginning of the game, um, and then the Giants had that turnover to give them the lead um, in, in the second half. So it all it all many balanced out, but who's going to win the turnover battle this week? Um, who's going to be able to execute uh, in, in big situations, whether it's red zone or points off of turnovers? How do you get that done? Uh, but Washington, I believe, wins 21 to 17. Yeah, just to just to put it on the record, we do our picks uh, over at Tally Site every week for for Big Blue View, and and I picked the Giants, and I admitted when I made that pick that <laughs> that I probably shouldn't be doing that, and that maybe it's a little bit with my heart and not as much with my head, but there's part of me that thinks there's there's part of me that thinks that the Giants, the way that that game unfolded a couple of weeks ago, there's part of me that thinks that the Giants might be a little bit better. But, I, you know, but again, I think it's a coin flip with these two teams. There, there's, there's one side of me that thinks that the Giants missed their opportunity by not winning that game on, you know, two weeks ago. But the other side of me thinks, you know, Saquon Barkley, has not had a huge game in about four or five weeks. He hasn't had any oh, of those do. monstrously long runs. And I know that Saquon Barkley said today, as a matter of fact, or Thursday, as a matter of fact, we're, our show is actually going up online on, on Friday. He said on Thursday – and I'm going to paraphrase that he thought Wednesday and Thursday were two of the best practices that he has had in a long time. So just if they, if they can get him a crease, Mm -hmm. if they can get him a crease, we know he can do some things. And I just, I feel like he's due for something. So we'll, we'll see if that, we'll see if that translates into, uh, into something on Sunday night. Yeah. Um. Last thing I'll say is Saquon. When he talks, I listen. Uh, I, I will never forget <laughs> the interview that he did with uh the Pivot podcast before the season started, and he was he was literally telling people like, as, again, don't quote me verbatim, but y'all y'all quit on me. Y'all thought just because I got hurt that I wasn't some dog as a running back. I am. I am that guy. And just because I had my injuries doesn't mean uh that you know my skill has gone away. It's just been unfortunate these last couple of years. I'll show you what's going on when this season starts. I'll tell you. Uh, I, mean, I, I can show you more than I can tell you type of deal. Uh, and, and lo and behold, Ed, that, that man, has he has taken off this year. Um, so trust me, when you say what you said, when he talks, I listen. And if you're saying that, and that's what Saquon said, I got my eyes on him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would assume that 11 Washington defenders will have their eyes on him on Sunday Absolutely. night too. All right. Hey, Jamal, thank you very, very much for uh, for uh, dropping by. It's the Trap or Dive podcast. And Jamal is also part of, of Hogs Haven. And it's if you want to check him out on Twitter, it's at Let Mall Tell It. So uh, check him out. Check out Hogs Haven for the uh, for the, the commander's viewpoint on, on Sunday's game. So uh, Giants fans, as always, thank you for, for listening. Please stay safe out there. Take care of each other, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.